Hello, and thank you for joining us on today's Knowledge Exchange Collaborative Webinar. I'm going to well, advance the slide here. So the Knowledge Exchange Collaborative is a joint initiative between the Mental Health Commission of Canada and the Canadian Centre on Substance Use and Addiction. And the goal is to bring together people in the fields of mental health and substance use and addiction who are interested in learning more about knowledge exchange and different kinds of projects in this area. As part of the collaborative, MHCC and CCSA are hosting a series of webinars <coughs> to highlight and discuss key issues and topics in these fields. Can folks hear me? I should have asked that for starters. Excellent. Um, and I'm glad that I didn't hear anyone say yes. That means you have successfully muted your phones. So my name is Doris Sayer. I'm a knowledge broker at CCSA, and I'll be moderating the webinar. So you'll hear from me occasionally. But I'm eager to hand it over to our speakers because we have a lot of um, uh, content that I'd like them to get through. But before we begin, um, a few housekeeping items. Uh, this webinar is being recorded and it will be posted with a French translation of the slides on the MHCC website uh, probably in a couple of weeks' time. Audio is provided in broadcast mode for your computer speakers, but you can also call into this webinar and as we've been saying, if you call in, we ask that you please mute your phones to avoid interference. Um, if you have any technical difficulties at any time, you can contact Adobe directly at the number that is listed on the slide. On the upper right-hand side of your screen, uh, where the red arrow is, uh, you'll see that you can download the slides from today's presentation. You just select the file and click the download button. And then finally, on the bottom right, you'll see a chat box that I see many of you have already found. Uh, you can use this chat box to ask any questions to us or to the speakers, and we'll have some time at the end to read out your questions for some Q&A. Okay, so today we'll be talking about the brain story, science and practice. Uh, the brain story is a body of knowledge that describes the relationship between early life stress and brain development and how this can influence the risk for substance use and mental health issues later on in life. The first presentation today will focus on the science behind these relationships and the second will focus on how one organization has applied the science to change how they deliver services. Uh, so I'm sorry. There's a, a slide has gone missing. But so I'm delighted to introduce our speakers for today. Nicole Sharon is the scientific director and senior program officer with the Palix Foundation. She has a PhD in neuroscience from Carleton University, and moved to Alberta in 2003 to hold an Alberta Heritage Foundation for Medical Research Neuroscience Canada Research Fellowship at the University of Lethbridge. Her research focus includes experience-based brain development neurodevelopmental disorders, and brain plasticity. Nicole joined the Palix Foundation in 2007 to mobilize the science of early brain development policy and professional practice. She both designs and delivers professional development opportunities across the health, education, human services, and justice sectors, and lends her expertise to nonprofits, committees, community-based projects, and research studies across Alberta. She also volunteers as a member of the board of directors for Calgary Alpha House Society. Cynthia Wild is the Director of Service Delivery with Big Brothers Big Sisters of Calgary and Area. And in this role, Cynthia works with her team to create, invest in, and empower life-changing relationships for children and youth facing adversity. Prior to joining BBBS last April, Cynthia was an early intervention specialist with Calgary Region Children's Services. And Cynthia also worked at the YWCA for 14 years and as Director of Services was responsible for designing and delivering programs for women experiencing domestic violence, poverty and homelessness, and their families. Cynthia holds a Master's of Social Work from the University of Calgary with a clinical specialization, as well as a Bachelor of Arts with a Criminology concentration from Carleton University. Um, I did uh, want to plug an initiative that uh, CCSA is uh, doing around the brain story. Um, if anyone has any questions about that, they are very welcome to get in touch with me, and I'll be glad to provide any information. And with that, uh, take it away, Nicole. 
All right. Thanks very much, Doris. And um, good afternoon or good morning, everyone, depending on where you are in the country. Um, so what I'm going to do for the first part of this webinar is cover off some principles of experience-based brain development, how early experiences can set us up on to life course trajectories, which um, can uh, potentially support positive outcomes across the lifespan um, or potentially negative outcomes across the lifespan. Um, and then uh, talk a little bit about what derails that developmental process, uh, which we now refer to as toxic stress. Um, and wrap with a uh, discussion of some of the um, uh, long-term outcomes associated with early exposure to toxic stress and how we now think about um, the science of resilience. And then I'll turn it over to my colleague, Cynthia Wild, from BBBS here in Calgary, um, to talk about how they have been using this science um, to actively build resilience in the youth with whom they work. Um, and as Doris said, hopefully we'll have um, a good chunk of time for questions at the end. So please feel free to type your questions um, into the chat box and we'll try and get through as many of them as we can. All right, so the first principle in experience-based brain development that I want to cover off for you is this idea that brain development is a long-term process. It's not an event. Um, it's a process that occurs, uh, begins shortly after conception and last long into what we used to think of the, of, as the adult period. So, um, uh, oh, wait a minute, I'm seeing here, volume seems really low, can it be increased? The volume on my phone, so I will try to speak a little bit louder, uh, if that helps. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, the brain continues to develop over a period of roughly 25 years. And you can think about that process of development is being very similar to the process that you would use to build a house. So just as where when you're beginning um, to plan your house, you need to start with a basic blueprint, um, but the blueprint doesn't really tell you exactly what that house is going to look like at the end of the day. That's going to depend on the finishings that you use in the house and the furnishings that you use. But it does give you a general idea of the relative size and shape, uh, the number of rooms that are in the house, where they're all uh, located to uh, located in relationship to one another. And in the same way, the brain uses a basic blueprint to guide development, and that's really our genes. But it turns out that our genes don't dictate what the quality of that structure is going to look like at the end of the day. That um, quality is going to be dictated by our experience. <clears throat> And so you can think about um, the sorts of experiences that we have as being very like the types of finishes that you use in your house and the quality of the furnishings. So if you have high-end finishes and furnishings, such as you know, the fancy marble countertops and the uh, lovely hardwood floors, um, your house is going to look a lot different than if you use the, um, you know, the, the formica and the peel and stick vinyl tiles. Um, and in the same way, the quality of the experiences that we have during development go a long way towards dictating the quality of the final structure of uh, the brain um, that we get over time. And again, when you're building a house, you know, one of the key things that you have to think about is the quality of your foundation. You want to dig a hole, lay a strong foundation before you frame up the walls and put the roof on top because that foundation has to support all of the development that's occurring on top. And in the same way, the brain develops by laying down a strong foundation of basic neural circuits, which need to support the development of all the more complex circuits which are building on top. You get a fault anywhere in that foundation, and you can potentially destabilize neural circuits which are developing afterwards. And I have a graphic representation of that for you here. Um, so in this particular slide, what you'll see is, I'm going to use the little arrow here, what you'll see is the number of connections that are being formed in neural circuits on the y-axis and age along the bottom here. And what I have for you are three representative neural circuits in the brain. The first representative neural circuit to develop in this diagram is represented by the yellow line. Um, and that is a sensory system, so things like vision, hearing, touch, taste, smell. And they're all coming online just before and just after birth. 
these are reasonably simple neural circuits um, that are forming in the brain, and they are providing a foundation for more complex circuits to develop on top. The more complex circuit, the next most complex circuit in this particular diagram is represented here by the blue line. Um, these are our language circuits, and they're coming online over the first year of life, and they're resting very much on the auditory inputs that they're receiving in that first year of life. We know that if uh, little babies can't properly hear spoken language um, in that first year of life, we can potentially destabilize the development of these language circuits through lack of auditory input. So having these sensory systems nice and strong and foundational are critical to the development of this next circuit here. And the last circuit um, that you see um, developing um, in this particular diagram is represented by the red line. These are higher cognitive functions. Uh, things like being able to uh, follow lots of rules, pay attention, um, interact with um, other peers in our environment, um, so learning how to get along with our peers. And those are very much resting on, first off, inputs from our sensory systems, which allow us to take in information about the world around us, and quite often our ability to communicate with other people, since we're a social species, um, and communication um, between members of the species is critical uh, to being able to <coughs> navigate in complex social environments. Mm -hmm. So again, if you um, have uh, yeah, language circuits not forming properly yeah. and potentially okay. sensory systems not forming properly, you can potentially sure. destabilize the development of these higher cognitive functions as well. Now, the, um, uh, the other thing that you can take away from this graph is a steep drop-off in connections in these circuits, which is occurring over time. This is a normal developmental process, and it's called pruning. It turns out that in neural circuits, more connections between the cells is not necessarily better. Um, and so the reason why pruning is such an important um, uh, process in brain development is because pruning is experience dependent. So what happens as neural circuits are developing is they receive essentially a genetic signal um, as to when the cells need to start reaching out and making connections with the other cells around them. But it's the connections that get used the most in the neural circuit as it's developing, which are going to get nice and strong and foundational. And the circuits, which don't get used very much, get weaker and weaker and eventually get pruned away over time. Um, so pruning occurs in essentially a use it or lose it process. And I have a picture of what that actually looks like um, in this next slide. So what I have for you here is a very thin slice through the cortex of the developing brain at three ages, birth, three years, and 14 years. And all of these um, little blobby regions in every one of these panels is the body of a cell. And all of the long lines that you see coming off um, of these cells are called axons and dendrites, and they're the places where the cells make the most connections with other cells around them. So the more long lines in this image, um, the more connections in this particular area of the brain. Um, and so what you'll notice is in, that, in the first panel, uh, at first, this circuit is really not yet wired up. There are almost no connections between the cells. By three years of age, there's been a huge explosion of connections between the cells in the circuit, and by 14 years, many of these connections are gone. Um, but this uh, uh, circuit at 14 years is going to be better and faster at processing information than it is at three years, and that's because the brain has increased the speed and efficiency with which it processes information by removing the connections in the circuit that aren't getting used very much and only maintaining the connections that get used a lot. So what does this actually mean when we think about the environments in which children are growing up? Well, children who are growing up in yeah, environments where they are able to um, receive lots of opportunities to practice pro-social skills, such as forming attachment-based relationships with the adults around them, early language and literacy, 
learning how to get along with their peers, learning good emotional control. Um, those are the circuits that are going to be strengthened in that child's brain. They are going to get faster and better at, at uh, processing that type of information and performing that type of skill. And so that kind of environment is really critical in helping set children up to do reasonably well, barring any other sort of situation or problem, um, as they enter the school system and as they continue to grow and mature. But if you have a child growing up in a different sort of environment, mm -hmm. an environment where perhaps they don't get the same opportunity to practice early language and literacy, um, practice learning good emotional control, practice getting along with their peers. Um, in this sort of case, um, that child is not going to have the same strong foundational base of those pro-social skills, um, which will set them up to likely do reasonably well as they continue to grow and mature. If you couple that with an environment wherein a child is uh, practicing um, lots of uh, behaviors involved in anger and aggression because perhaps there's domestic violence in their home and that is what they're seeing and that is what they're emulating, you're also not only going to be weakening the pro-social neural circuits, you're going to be strengthening neural circuits that we know are not going to really support good outcomes over time. So that pruning period um, and uh, that pruning process is critically important in setting children um, uh, on life course trajectory that can either um, uh, produce good or bad outcomes. Now, what are the most important experiences that children need to have in order to set them up to do well as they continue to grow and mature? Well, it turns out that research shows there's only one kind of experience which is really critical to the developing brain because if it's absent in the developmental period, we can see um, multiple uh, 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 deficits across uh, many different domains. And that experience really is a social experience. So I want you guys to think very broadly about what a social experience is. Um, we often describe this social experience as kind of like a serve and return style interaction between a child and a responsive adult. What it looks like is the child serves up some sort of indication that they want to communicate or interact, and the adult needs to return that interaction in a developmentally appropriate way and in a way that keeps the interaction going back and forth for a period of time. What those serve and return style interactions do in terms of the developing brain is give children the opportunity to practice, practice, practice pro-social skills which are going to strengthen those corresponding pro-social neural circuits in their brain. And so serve and return style social interactions are going to look different depending on the age and stage of a child. Um, but they are very critical, if you want to think about this example, um, in terms of how we learn how to speak. So a serve and return style interaction can look like a baby and an adult babbling back and forth. Um, when that adult returns the child's cue that they want to babble, um, what this does is it ramps up the child's enthusiasm for what they're doing and makes them want to do it over and over again. And this strengthens corresponding language circuits in the brain. A certain return style interaction could look like helping a child calm down when they are upset. Um, this helps the child practice, practice, practice coping skills and emotional control, strengthens those neural circuits in the brain. Um, so these certain return style interactions are really critical. And as, as we um, continue to mature, uh, it could look like helping your um, tween plan out the kinds of courses that they want to take in high school based on what they think they might want to do later in life. That's a long planning. Uh, type of activity, and that long-term planning skill is governed by neural circuits just like any other kind of skill set in the brain. Helps to strengthen those skills. It could look like helping your teenager get through the first time they get dumped in a romantic relationship because we need to learn how to cope with rejection. It's a life 
skills. So these serve and return style interactions are really, really critical um, across that developmental period. But in the early years, um, in the first few years of life, what they're doing is strengthening really basic cognitive, social, and emotional skills that set the stage and provide the foundation for another really critical skill set called executive function. So um, I'm sure that many of you have heard of executive function, but it's not a unitary phenomenon. It's not just one thing. Executive function is a whole set of skills which work together um, and allow us to navigate through the complex physical, social, and emotional environment that we need to navigate through every single day. So we often liken that skill set um, to an air traffic control system in the brain. So if you think about what's required um, of an air traffic controller, they're sitting up in their tower, and what do they have to do? They have to uh, pay attention to multiple uh, radar screens and, and attend to all of those blips which are playing uh, trying to land or trying to take off. They need to be able to remember and follow long lists of rules for different weather conditions. So if you've got fog, you're going to follow this protocol um, for organizing um, uh, departures and arrivals. And if you've got gusty winds from the northwest, you're going to follow this protocol. They have to be able to change when the information changes, um, and they need to be able to do that on the fly. When a new blip shows up on the screen that they weren't anticipating, suddenly we've got another flight. Now we might have to rejig all of the landing patterns to allow this new plane to land before they run out of fuel. And they need to be able to do all of this while understanding what's going on for them emotionally, controlling it, and ensuring that it's appropriate for the situation at hand. That's really that, that self-regulation piece. And so this is um, a really critical skill set because it predicts three main outcomes for us. It turns out that executive function predicts academic success. And so this is the difference between graduating from high school versus dropping out or flunking out. What do we need to do? We need to show up for school on a regular basis. We need to be able to get along with the teacher, get along with the other students in the class. We need to be able to complete our assignments on time and as asked. Um, and that is really, it turns out, what makes the difference uh, between high school graduation versus not. It's not the grades that you get. It's your executive function ability. <clears throat> this is also a critical skill set involved in being able to hold down a job. Think about what your employer asks of you on a regular basis. Show up on time. Get along with your colleagues and your boss. Maybe even be a creative problem solver. Um, delay your desire to spend um, four hours of your work day on Facebook. Save that for you know, when you're at home. Control your emotions in the workplace. Ensure that they're appropriate for the situation at hand. So it's really critical for that particular outcome. And it's also very critical in successful parenting of the next generation. If you think about what's required of a parent, you, know, you need to set your children's desires before your own. You need to be able to juggle multiple priorities. You need to be able to remember routines. And, and you need to be able to adjust that routine when the information changes. Um, and you need to be able to control your emotions when your kids are having difficulty controlling theirs. So it's an enormously important skill set. And it turns out that executive uh, function is located in an area of the brain called the prefrontal cortex, the area located behind the forehead and the eyes. Um, this area starts coming online very early in development, even within the first year of life. But it turns out that it's essentially the last area of the brain to fully mature. So our prefrontal cortex is not fully mature until we're in our mid to our late 20s. So we have a really, really long window in which to work with people and shore up their executive function skills um, if they're having difficulty with them. Um, <clears throat> so there's one other player um, that affects um, us during development, and that player is stress. And so it turns out, though, that not all stress is the same. It's important for kids to experience stress during development. And we refer to that type of stress as positive stress. This is a brief activation of the stress response system. Stress hormones go up. They come back to baseline very quickly. And what this type of stress does for children is it gives them developmentally appropriate challenges with which they can practice their stress coping skills. 
So stress coping skills are governed by neural circuits like any other skill set um, that we have. And it's important that kids get the opportunity to exercise those skills on a regular basis. So developmentally appropriate challenges are healthy for brain development. The next kind of stress that we talk about is called tolerable stress. So this is a more serious activation of the stress response system, but the key defining factor in tolerable stress is that the child has access to a caring, supportive adult who can help them buffer their response to the stress that they're experiencing. What this adult does is they act like a, an external stress response system for the child. Um, so in the absence of adult support, stress hormones might get high and remain high for long periods. But with adult support, the child is able to calm down much more quickly and receive a lot of support in practicing their coping skills. So in that way, tolerable stress doesn't leave a lasting impact on our biology. But the last kind of stress is the bad guy um, in, uh, in the stress family, and that's what we now refer to as toxic stress. So toxic stress is a prolonged activation of the stress response system, and the key here is that it's in the absence of adequate adult support. So the child does not have enough adult support to buffer their response to that stress. And that means that stress hormones um, increase they get high, and they remain high for long periods of time. And the constant exposure to those stress hormones um, gets biologically embedded in key ways. And that's what I want to turn to right now. Um, I know this is a busy slide. I'm not going to go through it in a lot of detail. But I do want you to know that our stress response system um, is essentially it's a brain circuit. The stress response begins and ends in the brain. When we experience um, we'll perceive a threat in the environment. A little nucleus right in the midbrain here kicks off a series of signals which will eventually dump stress hormones into the periphery and those stress hormones will activate us um, and get us prepared for either a fight or flight response. Um, we have a few different types of stress hormones and they all produce slightly different effects on our biology. You can see a list um, here along the side. Um, but I do want to call your attention to a stress hormone called cortisol um, because it has a couple of key effects on our biology. What cortisol does is it helps us maintain higher levels of activity for longer periods of time. So it affects multiple systems. Um, it uh, affects our metabolic system by helping us preferentially store fat because fat is a very rich source of energy in the human body. Um, it both suppresses um, our innate immunity um, and redirect that energy um, to other areas of the body which we need for fight or flight. So it will suppress our ability to fight off cold, flu, certain types of cancer. But it also activates other aspects of our immune system. These are inflammatory pathways which are really important in wound healing. Um, and, you know, this is an evolutionarily conserved system developed over millennia to do one thing really well, which is help us deal with short-term threats from predators. If you were fleeing from a predator, you might get mauled by that predator um, and get uh, breaks in the skin. Um, and so cortisol is, is going to activate that inflammatory response, which is going to speed wound healing. It's meant to be adaptive, um, but you know we rarely flee from predators nowadays. Um, rarely have breaks in our skin that we that we need to heal as a result of a stress response. So this inflammation. Um, floats around in the body without any sort of active target. But the last thing that cortisol does, which is in many ways one of its most important effects, is it crosses back into the blood-brain barrier, interacts at multiple levels along the stress response system to shut down the, the stress response, to shut down hormone production. So how does this response, when it's active all of the time, get biologically embedded in childhood? Well, there's three main ways. The first involves that wear and tear on our peripheral system, our cardiovascular system, our pulmonary system, our metabolic system, our immune system. Those systems are not designed to be chronically active um, in the way that they are active during a stress response. And so over time that produces wear and tear on those cells, which typically does not get repaired. And so if that stress response is active for long enough, we can produce damage which accumulates over time and potentially makes us vulnerable 
to diseases involving the pulmonary system, the cardiovascular system, uh, the uh, immune system, and the metabolic system. But the next two ways that um, toxic stress that's biologically embedded specifically involve the actions of cortisol on the brain. So cortisol has a number of different receptive fields in the brain. And the first one I want to talk about is right here in the prefrontal cortex, again, the seat of our executive function. What cortisol is doing there um, when it interacts with that area of the brain is helping to damp down those executive functions just a little bit to allow us to revert to a more reactive behavioral repertoire. It would not be adaptive for us if we were fleeing from a predator to want to sit down and think very carefully about multiple strategies of evading that predator. No, we want to make very snap, instantaneous decisions about what we are to do. And that's really the reason why cortisol has a receptive field. It is helping us to make snap decisions in the face of immediate threat. But when cortisol is bombarding that particular circuit, when it's trying to develop, when we're trying to exercise those functions um, and really solidify lots of connections within that circuit, it can potentially take some of our executive functions off their best developmental track because it interferes um, with that developmental process. And the last area that cortisol has an impact on in the developmental period is really on the functioning of this stress response system here. When cortisol interacts with this circuit um, and sends a signal to shut down hormone production, what it does is, is it essentially activates those cells. And those cells are not designed to be active all of the time. It depletes them of energy um, and, uh, and sets them up for damage. But unlike our peripheral cells, Brain cells can actually change in response to the, the signals that they receive, and that's exactly what they do. They adapt to that strong cortisol signal by removing connections from the circuit, which is um, a self-preservation mechanism for these cells. It allows them to survive in the face of constant cortisol bombardment, but it changes the configuration of this entire stress response circuit and creates inefficiencies in shutting down hormone production. So it's a bit of a vicious cycle. The more toxic stress you have, the more cortisol that you have circulating in your body, circulating back into your brain, and trying to shut down hormone production, over time the less efficient you become at shutting down hormone production, and the more cortisol you end up um, <coughs> excuse me, having circulating in, in the body and in the brain trying to shut down that response. And so what we see in many children who've experienced toxic stress, as well as in adults who report experiencing significant amounts of toxic stress in childhood, is we often see higher levels of baseline circulating cortisol over the course of the day. So these are going to be people who are inefficient at shutting down their stress response system. Their stress response system is going to be essentially always a little bit active. And these are going to be people who are more reactive to threats or even perceived threats in their environment. They're going to be more responsive. They're going to be vigilant, perhaps a little bit irritable, perhaps a little bit aggressive, maybe not quite so good at problem solving because keep in mind, um, they have this um, executive function circuit which is under constant bombardment by cortisol as well. Not as good at controlling their emotions, not as good at delaying gratification, et cetera. So in those three ways, toxic stress can exert a pretty um, in, in, uh, high impact on our biology and our, on our ability to cope with challenges later in life. So now I just want to cover a couple of um, outcomes associated with early adversity. This is data from the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study, which is one of the largest studies of its kind. Um, it's a partnership between Kaiser Permanente, a big HMO in California, and the Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta. What they did was they asked over 17,000 middle class, middle aged, average age was about 55, um, highly educated, uh, employed, mostly Caucasian Californians, coming in for their periodic health exam, a 10 item questionnaire. And the 10 items were, before the age of 18, did you ever experience and there were five types of childhood maltreatment and five types of family dysfunction. And they were physical uh, neglect, emotional neglect, 
physical abuse, emotional abuse, or sexual abuse? Um, did they witness domestic violence? Was anyone in their household a substance abuser? Was anyone in their house, or did anyone in their household have an untreated mental illness? Did anyone in their household um, go to jail for any period of time? And did they ever um, experience separation from a for any reason, including divorce? And if people answered yes, um, they got a one, um, and if they answered a no, they got a zero. And so in terms of the questionnaire, you know, you could get a score out of 10. So what they did then was they um, added up the scores uh, for these people, and they called it the Adverse Childhood Experience Score. And in all of the next uh, three slides, what you're going to see is that ACE score along the bottom, and you're going to see risk for different types of outcome across the side. And what you see in this particular slide is the risk for substance misuse problems in adulthood. And what you see is a dose-response relationship between ACE score and the likelihood that someone will end up with a problem with alcoholism or illicit drug use in adulthood. And what do we know about people who end up with substance misuse problems later on in life? Well, many people are self-medicating because of depression symptoms, anxiety symptoms. Uh, many of these people, um, if they've experienced early toxic stress, will not have um, very strong executive functioning skills and might have a hyper-responsive stress system. And all of those types of um, issues set people up for having substance misuse problems later on. This is the risk for developing a major depressive episode in adulthood. And what you can see again is this dose response relationship between ACE score and the risk for developing depression in adulthood. Again, this goes right back to who are people who've experienced um, early toxic stress? They're people who don't cope well with the problems in their lives, have a hyper-responsive stress system, and all of these things can set us up to be more vulnerable to depressive disorders in adulthood. <clears throat> and the last slide that I want to show you is the relationship between ACE score and other types of public health problems, many of which are linked to um, addiction and mental health. The first one is current smoking status, obesity rates, attempted suicide, uh, using injection drugs, or ever had an STI. Um, and as you can see, there's a dose-response relationship between each one of these public health issues and ACE score. So we know that these types of um, uh, problems are, um, first off, um, quite impactful on our biology, and second off, can lead to a lot of difficulties with addiction and mental health problems later on in life. Um, but the one thing that I would like to emphasize as well is that it's not just addiction and mental health problems um, which increase um, in people with high ACE scores. We see relationships between ACE scores with a whole host of different physical health problems and social outcomes as well. Don't have enough time to cover those here, but rest assured that um, addiction and mental health are not the only outcomes which are um, implicated uh, in people who have high ACE scores. Okay, so that was a lot of bad news, but it turns out that not everyone who experiences ACEs or who experiences toxic stress in childhood ends up with poor outcomes in adulthood. And so the last um, issue that I want to cover for you here is how we now think about um, resilience. And so for a long time, we used to think of resilience as a lucky trait of certain people. Um, and so hopefully you were born with it. And if you weren't born with it, there wasn't much that we could do. And that's not how we think about resilience now. We think about it as both a process of building skills and capacities, as well as an outcome. So a positive outcome in the face of negative experiences. So you can think about resilience as being very like this scale that I have for you here on the slide. The scale has positive experiences on one arm and negative experiences on the other. A resilient outcome means that the scale always tips in the positive direction regardless of whether or not we have negative weight. And in order to get that scale to tip positive, what, what we want to do is load up that positive arm with all of the supportive, nurturing, skills building, serve and return style interactions that we know um, will build that positive capacity in the brain. We want to try and prevent as much as possible having too much weight on the negative arm. 
But if it does occur, we want to buffer that weight with supportive adult relationships. We can also think about this fulcrum as being really critical to how easy it is to tip that scale to one side or the other. You move that fulcrum in one direction, and it makes the scale easy to tip negative. Move it in the other, and you can uh, make the scale very, very easy to tip positive. Well, you can think about this fulcrum as being our biological capacity for resilience, what we're born with. But it turns out that um, our, our biology is not actually our destiny. The experiences that we have have a big impact um, through biological embedding on the internal skills and capacities we have, which means that we can use supportive adult relationships in that early developmental period to shift this fulcrum over to one side and make it easier and easier to tip that scale in the positive direction. That's how we think about resilience as really being a capacity. And lastly, um, it's never too late to build these skills. The blue line here represents the brain's capacity to change in response to experiences. And what you can see is that it never goes to zero. We always retain the ability um, to make change in neural circuits. But it is, obviously, easier, faster, and cheaper to do it in a developmental period. What changes is the amount of time and effort that's required. This goes up as we age. Um, but the way we think about building skills and abilities in adults is exactly the same as we think about building it in children, which is through, again, that supportive relationship and the practice, practice, practice of skills and abilities. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Cynthia Wild, who's going to talk about what she's been doing to build those skills and abilities um, with the youth that she works with. Thank you, Nicole, and um, thank you to the webinar organizers for providing me with an opportunity to share the exciting work that Big Brothers Big Sisters has done and continues to do as a result of integrating brain science into our organizational culture and service delivery uh, practices. I'm just waiting for the slide deck to be loaded on the webinar screen here. Oh, there we go, perfect. Um, so many of you on the phone will know of Big Brothers Big Sisters. Uh, we're a mentoring organization, and we're one of 108 member agencies of Big Brothers Big Sisters of Canada. And as a national movement, we provide mentoring services to over 40,000 youth across 1,300 communities in Canada. And as we define it here in Calgary, mentoring is a nurturing, supportive relationship between a caring individual and a young person facing adversity in order to help that young person discover who they are, to learn and practice the cognitive and social-emotional skills required to realize their full potential, and to learn how to connect with and contribute to the world around them. At Big Brothers Big Sisters of Calgary and area, mentoring takes place in, in the community and in school. Last year, we served over 1,700 children and youth approximately 750 through community-based mentoring and 970 uh, through our in-school programming. Our introduction to the brain science was a result of the Change in Mind Initiative, uh, which has fundamentally transformed uh, the way that we do business here at our organization. In November of 2014, the Alliance for Strong Families and Communities in the United States, in partnership with the Palix Foundation in Alberta, was awarded a grant from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation to create a two-country cohort focused on integrating brain science research into the nonprofit human serving sector with an emphasis on influencing policy and creating systems change. In 2015, uh, we, along with 14 other cohort sites, four of them were in Alberta as well, and 10 were scattered throughout the United States, received two-year grant funding to infuse, align, and accelerate the brain science research within our organization. This slide provides an overview of change in mind. The project duration was formally two years, although we continue to be involved with the Palix Foundation and the Alberta cohort of agencies in disseminating the learnings from change in mind at conferences and audiences of interested stakeholders like today. There were six in-person convenings 
held over two years, which featured presentations by, by cross-sector experts, including those from the field of neuroscience, developmental evaluation, and framing complex social issues so they were translatable to the public. A critical part of the project was the opportunity for sharing among the cohort partners as each developed customized approaches to integrating the science into their particular professional context. Time doesn't permit a deep dive into the strategic elements and intent of the Change in Mind initiative, apart from the brief highlights that I'm going to share through this webinar today. But I would encourage you to access the full project reports that are available through the Alliance for Strong Families and Communities website uh, if you use the search term Change in Mind Institute. As part of the terms of participation in Change in Mind, selected organizations were expected to leverage the science to impact and influence multiple streams. The agency or organizational stream, the systems change stream at, at local, provincial, and national levels, and ultimately at the policy level stream. The majority of this presentation describes changes that occurred at the organizational level. However, I thought I'd share this slide to illustrate how we at uh, BBBS envisioned systems change unfolding within our sphere of influence. As part of a national organization, we hope to encourage the national office as well as other member organizations across the country to share in our excitement about the potential of the core story of brain development with its emphasis on caring, responsive relationships to elevate the status of mentoring from a nice to have to a needs to have in the minds of those concerned with helping vulnerable children and youth. We also hope that the science would inform and shape practice, including enhancements to volunteer mentor training. We had similar aspirations in terms of our connection with the Alberta Mentoring Partnership, an umbrella mentoring organization with a key role in knowledge sharing and building the capacity of mentor mentoring organizations across the province. Finally, as an important funder and strategic partner of BBBS, we hope to share insights with family and, and community support services uh, in Calgary. Now, this is a very busy slide, um, but really it's basically a bit of a blueprint um, and that we developed early on to, to illustrate how we might systematically and strategically infuse brain science within our organization, starting with greater staff and volunteer awareness, then insight into possible application of the brain science, its practices, onto prototyping some innovative mentoring strategies, and possibly scaling up those that had promise with the ultimate goal of increasing resiliency of children and youth. It was important early on to have greater board and donor awareness and support. They were viewed as critical to the success of the initiative, and a deliberate engagement of the board occurred at the project's inception. The organization's culture, capacity, and resources for managing these processes strengthened as the project unfolded, but only after the safety to fail forward was established. So after we created the blueprint for the journey, in practical terms, this is where we started, learning the language of brain science and trying to immerse ourselves in the key concepts that Nicole unpacked for us earlier in the webinar. As those staff received training on the key concepts of the core story in classroom-style format and were provided with additional resources, such as the link to the Alberta Family Wellness Initiative website and the Harvard University Center on the Developing Child, which are basically the two, two key places I refer people to go to, the leap from theory to practice still felt quite mysterious to the frontline staff who struggled with how to integrate the science into their day-to-day -day work with youth, families, and mentors. As a next step, and with the guidance of developmental evaluator Mark Cabage from Edmonton, we embarked on a 90-day campaign to develop and test prototypes. These were small ideas, concepts, ways of integrating brain science into our mentoring work. The prototypes were developed by frontline staff with very little time and guidance as part of a half-day workshop activity, and then quickly tested with their peers for rapid feedback. Enhancements to each of the five prototypes were made based on the feedback, and then these five prototypes formed the basis of a 90-day campaign designed to experiment with infusing brain science into practice. There were additional benefits of experimenting as well, such as the possibility that it might lead to stronger mentoring outcomes, increase our brand competitiveness, and strengthen the agency's capacity for innovation in general. 
Unfortunately, time does not permit me to share with you all the details and the specifics of the five prototypes and their ultimate evolution and fate after the 90-day campaign. However, I can share that four of the five evolved in such a way that elements of them have been integrated into key aspects of service delivery, including child family enrollment, staff development, and mentor training. One of the prototypes um, that is pictured in this slide that staff developed, um, they named Board Beyond Imagination. And it was based on, and board being B-O-A-R-D, Beyond Imagination. It was based on the Shoots and Ladders board game, which when I was growing up was called Snake, Snakes and Ladders. And the game cards include challenges that mentors and mentees may face together, as well as potential positive responses to those challenges. This idea was tested with three different audiences, and the game was refined based on feedback from participants. For example, the group learned from the first trial that there were some logistical kinks to work out, as well as changes in gameplay that could facilitate more learning and integration of the neuroscience. They integrated a card drawing strategy rather than pre-selected mentoring scenarios for each space on the board game to provide more variety. And they also integrated bonus spaces earned when participants were able to connect their scenario to four primary neuroscience categories. The team enlisted staff members for the first two prototype trials and then asked team mentors to assist in testing the prototype a third time. Currently, this game continues to be used for our team mentor training. So as you can see, the prototypes were not sophisticated in design. They were done in a very quick and dirty format um, where frontline staff were asked to, okay, here are the concepts um, in a quick format how would you, um, knowing our mentoring practices and all the various steps uh, for families and volunteers, where could you see us infusing the brain science? So they were um, not sophisticated at all, but the idea was that um, we want you to start chewing on these concepts, start thinking about how to integrate them, and become innovative. Um, because that's really what it was required for us to do to infuse the concepts, because there was no prescribed map uh, that we could follow. So it was a, it was a very fun process and um, in engaged the entire organization. So how exactly did our participation in change in mind and infusing the brain science into our work create a paradigm shift within our organization? Well, it gave us a new narrative of why mentoring. Why is mentoring important? Well, now we know that relationships with caring, responsive mentors build healthy brain architecture, which is a, a huge message for volunteers, um, you know, whereas before it's, hey, you know, the, the thought was as a volunteer you can have a friendship with a young person, um, do something positive, but we really didn't have the science to determine what that positive end result was. Now we know that they actually build healthy brain architecture through those serve and return relationships that Nicole spoke about earlier. So serve and return is the what of effective mentoring. We had a new narrative. We know that brains are built through back and forth interactions. And for children in the middle years and youth and adolescents, these come in the form of developmental relationships that express care, provide support, challenge growth, share power, and expand possibilities. We now understand the two processes that are critical to healthy cognitive, social, and emotional development, executive function and self-regulation. We also know that how mentors can help build and strengthen these skills in these areas and have embedded those um, into our mindful mentoring training for volunteers. So we're um, the only Big Brothers Big Sisters organization in the country that has a mandatory um, second part training for all um, of our volunteers. And that mindful mentoring is part two, which goes over concepts from the core story on brain development, including um, executive function and self-regulation, and really breaks it down into tangible ways that mentors can um, help foster and strengthen skills in these areas through practice and coaching. Earlier, we heard Nicole talk about the impact of toxic stress and ACEs. The brain science and one of the prototypes that, it, that um, we were experimenting with that asked about ACEs at intake has completely transformed our understanding of who we serve and we are now using an intentional approach to screening in children and youth facing adversity. As this slide illustrates, a recent review of a randomly selected sample of client files revealed that 
of our mentees in our one-to-one -on -one community-based program have experienced four or more forms of adversity. This was an important message for us to talk to um, our community about and our stakeholders who up until this graphic really had a perception that our agency was pretty much a universal organization that um, served children from single parent families but had few other adversities in their lives. So this was um, created a lot of aha moments out there in our dialogue with our stakeholders. And we can see from this slide that um, a closer look at the nature of the adversities. And yes, while 78% of um, uh, children experienced parental separation or divorce, um, they, there, there was, uh, and maybe not entirely surprising to this audience who I'm speaking to, um, because you're in the field primarily, you'll see that over 40% of our mentees also experienced separation from a parental figure, history of family violence, and mental health problems, uh, followed closely by being bullied. Um, we were then getting clearer on who we're best positioned to serve, and it's also meant to shift away from a universal approach for us to a client enrollment based on the philosophy that, uh, away from uh, the philosophy that any child who wants a mentor gets a mentor, to a more early intervention and targeted approach based on the philosophy that any child who needs a mentor gets a mentor. And who needs a mentor? Children and youth facing adversity. And of those 15% targeted programming that you see on the slide, those would include children and youth we serve that have system involvement, children and youth in care involved with uh, the criminal justice system, children and youth at risk of gang involvement, um, and those types of um, higher risk youth. Working with children and youth with complex histories has meant that trauma, and in particular relational trauma, is often part of the personal narrative that has shaped the internal working model of what to expect in relationships with adults. Uh, this is particularly challenging in our work for mentors who often misinterpret a trauma response and associated distrust as a lack of interest in, in having a relationship with a mentor. Therefore, staff and mentor training around using a trauma-informed lens has become core training at our agency. Perhaps the most potent research from our perspective is the research connecting resilience in childhood to having at least one stable, committed relationship. This quote from the National Scientific on the, Count on the Developing Child um, around resilience and that the single most common finding is that children who end up doing well despite these adversities have had at least one stable and committed relationship with a supportive parent, caregiver, or other adult has become um, incredibly important um, to, our, to our work. We know that mentors promote resiliency in children and youth when they provide supportive and nurturing relationships and opportunities for them to develop self-confidence, self-awareness, and self-esteem. This includes helping youth develop skills to cope with, adversity, and manage their emotions in a healthy way. I hope that in addition, to, in addition to making you all feel like having a piece of this beautiful cake, this slide is meant to drive home the point that brain science is not just another add-on, but rather that it has the possibility of fundamentally transforming your work by becoming baked into everything you do, how you view your clients, how you frame their challenges, and ultimately how you support their mental health and well-being. Finally, I want to make a plug for the Brain Story Certification course developed by the Alberta Family Wellness Initiative. All Big Brothers Big Sisters staff in Calgary, our service delivery staff and students, are required to take the 30-hour Brain Story Certification as part of their agency onboarding. Staff have found the content to be very informative and helpful in reinforcing brain science concept, concepts, especially important for our new staff. So that is where I'll end my presentation. Thank you very much. OK, well, thank you very much to both of our speakers. That was fantastic and very informative. Uh, we do have some time set aside for some questions and answers. But before we do, I just quickly want to bring it back to CCSA's initiative, uh, which is around, and you do have the slide in the slide deck that you can download. Um, so the initiative is meant to support professionals in moving brain story knowledge into practice, so very similar to what Cynthia just described. And to do this, we're throwing an event called the Brain Builders Lab in March of next year, where stakeholders from across the country will develop projects that reflect brain story science. And the knowledge base uh, for this will come from the Brain Story Certification course, which you see on your screen here. Um, 
and the purpose is to build the capacity and connections that it takes to advance practice and knowledge mobilization around ACEs. So unfortunately, the application deadline to attend the lab has just passed, but we do plan to, send, uh, to set up a community of practice over the two years that attendees will be implementing their projects. So if you have any interest in getting involved and connecting with any of the projects in your area that will be implemented, uh, you're still very welcome to get in touch, and uh, the slides that you download will have uh, the contact information. Uh, so with that, I, let me move on to some questions. Uh, and you're very welcome to type them into the chat box, and then we will read them out. Um, all right, so, so we've got a question. Oh, I was just going to say, um, I noticed somebody asking about where they can get more information on the Brain Story Science course. And I did want to say that it's on our Alberta Family Wellness Initiative website, which is albertafamilywellnessinitiative.org, um, and there's a link to training um, right on the home page, and that will bring you to um, the home page for the course uh, where you can register to take it. Okay, we do have a question uh, from Kimberly Mullen. Is the BBBS training open to other therapists, teachers, and other helping professionals? Um, well, our training is quite specific to um, to mentoring um, and to, to for our mentors, but we certainly have presented um, to schools and and groups around um, around the approach and also the brain science concept. So, um, but it's specifically mindful mentoring has been specifically designed for our mentors. Okay, and another question we have uh, was: Does four story certification apply to BBBS in Ontario? The core story certification it course is available to anybody around the globe. Um, it is a fantastic course. It's 30 hours, um, and you get a certification printed at the end. And uh, I know that, and Nicole, you could speak more that, to it than, than that, but I know that um, the, the Wellness Initiative is actually tracking how many people have taken the course, and it truly is a global um, course. Yeah, absolutely, Cynthia. Thanks. Um, and just for people to know, um, in at least in Alberta, um, you can get continuing education credits um, for different types of professions um, if you complete and submit your certification to, for example, the Alberta College of Social Work, the um, Psychologist Association of Alberta, the Pharmacist Association of Alberta, um, and if there are any physicians on the phone, um, my understanding is that the College of Family Physicians of Canada and the Royal College uh, will accept um, uh, the certificate um, and give you some CME credits, the same as you would for uh, reading uh, journal articles and that sort of thing. I don't know if in Ontario, the Ontario College of Social Work would um, give equivalent credits for something that the Alberta College has um, accredited. Uh, that would be a question for the Ontario yeah. College or any other um, provincial college that you can think of. Okay, thanks. Uh, we have a question that I think is aimed at uh, Nicole. So earlier an earlier slide indicated early adversity um, results in mental health risk later. How do you distinguish the risk uh, was not from heredity? So this is a really good question, and it's um, the kind of the one major topic that I did not have time to go over um, because you know we were discussing this webinar to a total of one hour and fifteen minutes. And um, the topic is really that um, you know what the developmental neuroscience has shown over the past several decades is that um, there is no such thing as nature versus nurture. Um, so there are very, very, very few outcomes, very few disorders, diseases that are exclusively as a result of either genetic inheritance, so a few faulty genes that you have, or um, an environmental influence. The truth that we have now had to grapple with is that these outcomes are a product of the experiences that we have 
and our biology. Um, and uh, certainly these experiences, it turns out, also influence gene expression. This is a process um, that we refer to as epigenetics. Um, I'm not necessarily going to unpack all of it for you right now, but suffice it to say that the postnatal experiences that we have can actually influence. Um, oh, it sounds like somebody's making a martini or a, a margarita or something there. It's like a blender just turned on. Um, but it turns out that the postnatal experiences that we have can also influence gene expression. Um, and it turns out that there are potentially thousands of genes that are involved. Um, but we studied quite carefully specific genes involved in our mood regulation system and in our stress regulation system. And we know that these early toxic stress experiences um, can influence that gene expression in key ways that potentially set us up um, to be vulnerable or to be potentially resilient to these types of um, uh, inter, um, outcomes. And so we no longer really think about different types of outcomes as being either exclusively genetic or exclusively environmental. We now have to think about how these two areas work together and how they interact to um, uh, uh, lead to specific outcomes across the lifespan. Okay, thank you. Here's a question that has come in uh, a couple of times in different forms. How do you assist a student or a child that is in constant toxic stress or that is experiencing it in the moment and it may be ongoing? Um, well, I can give a little bit of a scientific response and then maybe Cynthia would like to take over with something more practical. Um, certainly we know that supportive adult relationships can help to buffer um, a child's stress response system. Um, so having an adult present um, who is actively working to help calm that child down um, and assisting them in practicing coping skills um, is, is really important when a child is experiencing stress in the moment. And I think, you know, um, when a child is experiencing stress, it often comes out in terms of various behaviors. And asking the question of what's underlying those behaviors um, would be really critical to start with. But Cynthia, I'll turn it over to you to maybe talk about um, some of the ways that, that you might suggest mentors um, assist uh, the kids and youth that they work with in coping with uh, successful challenges in their lives. Um, yes, well, I think part of it for us is just looking at um, ways of helping I guess that, that's a complex question actually because there's, I have multiple answers, but um, in terms of what what happens on the ground with some of our mentors, I'm thinking of our in-school mentors, um, we really try to go back and fall back on Bruce Perry's work looking at um, the three R's and how important it is to regulate, relate, and reason. Because we have uh, mentors as teachers who are trying to reason uh, all, many times with young people who are clearly dysregulated and they're, they are not able to reason because are not able to access that part of the prefrontal cortex that actually can can listen and digest that material because they are um, they are busy trying to manage a flight or fight response because of what's happening in their environment. Perhaps because of the trauma they're experiencing at home, they are misinterpreting cues in their environment or threats in their environment. So I think the number one um, thing that I advise piece of advice that I um, I give to in our mentor training is when you clearly have a child who's dealing with toxic stress and they have a difficulty time uh, attending to the task at hand or or, re or reasoning um, is just the importance of co-regulation. So whether that's um, doing some mindfulness work, running around the school, um, whatever you think that young person might be up to, doing some breathing exercises, some yoga, and we've seen the introduction of some mindfulness um, in many school systems, and I'm really pleased with that approach because so many kids are going to school and dealing with that. Uh, I guess a broader answer um, is that um, is finding out, like Nicole said, what, 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 where that behavior is coming from, whether or not there are other professionals involved with that family, and finding out what um, what can be done to um, to support that young person uh, in um, in dealing with or uh, what's happening in the home in ways that can create safety. Because safety, um, for kids who've experienced trauma, safety and control and choice 
are three really key concepts. So I would say to teachers, offer control and choice uh, whenever you can. And really, if there's a way to communicate with that young person and find out what they need to feel safe, not just physically, but emotionally as well in the classroom. And it might be something about bringing in a, you know, a favorite toy that they have, a comfort item, maybe it's holding a rock, maybe it's, so it's, it's going to be very unique on that individual, but looking at what does it take to, to help create an environment of safety for that young person. Okay, in the interest of time, maybe we'll take two more questions. Uh, here's a, a very good question. Have you developed any guidance or tools on how to talk about toxic stress with youth, and is, are the videos meant to be viewed by youth? The videos that we've developed um, through the Alberta Family Wellness Initiative are really designed for uh, professionals um, to share with their clients. Um, so that they are more public messages, but I think we've had more of an eye to adult clients. Um, I'll ask Cynthia, um, uh, it, you know, if um, any of the kids and youth um, uh, get any of this brain development information, either through BBS or through the mentors. Um, well, certainly our mentors are getting the information, as, and that includes our teen mentors. Um, I I would suggest that that's part of that. Um, that the onboarding of teen mentors is, is that whole understanding what behaviors they might see and how to frame those behaviors um, in terms of not what's wrong with that young person but what happened to that young person and using that trauma-informed lens. The actual youth themselves, we deal with a lot of children between 6 and 12 and um, the focus really is on more ways of helping um, them uh, regulate more than uh, mm. sort of teaching directly to those young people what is toxic stress or that, that kind of concept. Great. Okay, and we'll make this the last question. If anyone has any questions after this or anything comes to mind after we end, uh, you can email us the questions and we can get them answered that way. So the last question is around the age of adversity. So if a very healthy early childhood is followed by adversity later uh, at 15 or 16 years old, does it cause less or more severe? Um, um, sorry, go ahead. I'm, I'm trying to understand the question. Does it cause less, more severe, or less severe compared to much earlier adversity? So I think the question is, um, a healthy childhood followed by adversity later on in the teenage years, what does that look like in comparison? Well, what, what happens in terms of uh, what's at risk in the developing brain is, you know, it's more what is developing at a key time. Um, uh, and so in um, uh, adolescence, what you'll see are um, uh, circuits like the executive function system, uh, the reward and motivation system, which are still developing. And those systems are, uh, and, and the social and emotional skills um, system, those systems are all potentially at risk um, when you experience adversity in adolescence. And so it's not that, it's not that adolescence is um, not necessarily a, a time for risk, but if you think about what sort of skill sets are developing in early childhood and think about that idea of simple circuits supporting the development of more complex circuits over time, if you're derailing um, some of these more simple circuits early on in childhood um, and you're not able to shore them up that well, you can potentially continue to have destabilization running through um, more complex circuits as they develop. So generally speaking, yes, the earlier the adversity is, um, you know, potentially you can have um, much more um, dramatic and widespread effects, uh, effects on brain development, but I don't want people to get the sense that um, adolescence is not um, an equally risky period for experiencing toxic stress. Um, it's just different circuits um, potentially that can get derailed. So for example, um, you know, you can derail, derail language circuits um, if you experience adversity early in development, but there is a sensitive period in which those language circuits are forming, and once you um, go beyond that sensitive period, you're unlikely to have adversity affect language circuits because they're fairly mature. Um, so in that way, the timing of adversity does matter, um, but, but every developmental period is a risk period for certain skills and abilities that are developing at that time. 
Okay, well, thank you very much. I think we'll end it here. Uh, again, you can download the slide deck now in the upper right, and you can revisit the webinar in a couple of weeks when it is posted on the MHPC website. Thank you so much, Nicole and Cynthia, for sharing your information with us. That was uh, really informative and great. And thanks, everyone, for joining us on this webinar.